Hey, everybody. This is your host, Mario Dennis, with the Keeping It Real Estate podcast. And today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Before I introduce my guest, I'm going to show you a little video of them. What's going on with the Property Pros is actually amazing. We started uh, in December, it'll be seven years, um, in a small office in St. Cloud, about 150 square foot. Now we've grown to uh, over three offices and about approximately 60 agents, uh, going from absolutely nowhere on the map to about $70 million in sales and growing. I've been in real estate five years um, and I've been at all the big name brokerages if you can think of it I've been there um, but I really found my home here at the Property Pros Real Estate because their structure is completely different uh, we're not one of the people that just want whatever agents gonna come into the business we want producers we want people that are actually serious about this business and take it as a career and that's what each and every one of us do uh, currently we're looking for new agents we're looking for someone that fills our culture we're a fun team but we're about business all of our agents are educated uh, when we go out there, we know how to write contracts, and uh, at, the, at the end of the day, um, we, we just want to continue to grow on what we're, we're already building. If it wasn't for the Property Pros, um, I wouldn't be where I am today. The Property Pros are family. If you want to take care of your client, if you want to advance your career to the next stage, and if you want to get paid on time, then you definitely want to be with the Property Pros. If you're not 120% happy at your brokerage, feel free to give us a call at the Property Pros. We want to breathe new air into your real estate career. No pro. All right. So, Anthony, how are you doing? Uh, a little embarrassed. I'm not used to, to being on uh, video. So, uh, oh, man, I that was awesome. That. Are you kidding me? That was perfect. <laughs> you guys did awesome. Thank you. Um, normally, I do an introduction, but I saw that you guys had just done the video. So I figured that would be way better than me doing an introduction. Amazing introduction. We just did the video today. So thank yeah, you. Perfect. Um, so. Um, tell me a little bit about your company, how long you've been in the business, um, and what should people start to know about you and get to well, know you? You know, we started, um, I got my real estate license in 2002. Uh, like a lot of people, um, I enjoyed the good life during the, the market boom. Uh, when it crashed, uh, so did I. And um, ended up uh, going back into a business. I, I owned a timeshare company for a while, so I did that. Um, didn't want anything to do with, uh, with real estate anymore. I couldn't even watch a show on TV. I, I was like, I'll never do that again. And my other half was like, don't say never. And I'm like, never. And then, um, I, how property pros actually came about. I, I was doing timeshare resales for Marriott's and Hilton's. And, um, one day started dabbling with a house here, a house there. And it just didn't happen no more. I would come in and go, I don't have time for the timeshare stuff. I, I got to go show properties and it snowballed um I, at the time my friend was a handyman and he worked with this company called american residential properties which no longer exists they were bought out and he said this lady has some properties and, and she wants somebody to rent them out she'll give you the first month's rent I said send send her my way and um she called me up she said well you know you sound you have a team in place and of course i'm like sure i did and um i didn't and uh, a couple of days later she sent me 38 properties and oh, I said, wow. here, go rent them out. And turn, come to find out, American Residential uh, Properties at the time had about 1,500 properties in Central Florida. So, you know, everything is, is done by the man upstairs, I would believe. And he was looking out for me. And he gave me an opportunity. And I built from there. Yeah, I think one of the things that happened when the market crashed, those of us um, who lived through it, is we became a little bit jaded about the industry because... You know, for people that weren't part of that, they don't understand how sudden it was. There, there wasn't some, you know, slow decline of things. It was, it was almost like an overnight feeling of emptiness. It was, um, at the time I was doing mortgages, and I remember I had like four pending files, and 
um, guidelines were changed in the middle of underwriting and those four files fell apart and I had no business and then I had no business for the next week and then and it was over. Yeah, very similar situation here. I mean, like you said, you, you got something at the closing table and all of a sudden, oh, that company was red flagged. I remember talking to sellers going, hey, you know, we got to reduce 10,000 and by next week, another 10,000, maybe 20. That's how fast it happened. And, and it was like, it was all wiped out from under you that quick. So I agree. Yeah. And, um, you know, much like you, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this again. You know, I was, I was certainly, it was kind of like a dog that just got hit. You know, I was like licking my wounds for mm -hmm. a little while. Um, but we're in a good market. It, it feels much different now. It's felt much different for the past almost close to 10 years at this point, you know, since the, recovery started taking place it feels like we're we're in a healthier market overall the mortgages are better what do you think yeah i i think it's definitely um organic growth because you know central florida itself has always grown but what's it what's in the works now we we've got a good 10 years worth of growth which is great um of course you know the the mortgage industry isn't the same as what it was um, back in 04, when, you know, if you had a 700 credit score, you just telling me you made 200,000 a year and signed for whatever mortgage you wanted. So, you know, that's changed. I, I think the consumer's a little more cautious now. Not everybody with the equities going out and taking hundred thousand dollar equity lines and, and doing that. So I, I think that overall the consumer and the market's, um, very healthy for, for quite some time now. I think we've got a long run here. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that people sometimes underestimate is that the children of short sales and foreclosures, the, the, the kids that had to move three times, the kids that saw the sheriff come and kick them out of the house, those are the millennial buyers now. And people like to bag on millennials a whole lot, but that is the biggest segment of buyers that's coming into the market. And and those people... I, the millennial buyers that I've dealt with are so much more cautious and so much more financially responsible than you would expect, you know, let's say a 25 year old because they lived through all that. They were the children of the parents that were foreclosed, you know, like the, the children of the parents that did a home line equity, uh, a home equity line of credit to go buy a boat, you know, and then they lost the boat and the house. Um, so, so it's definitely, I like the market that we're in because of that, because it seems like everyone's a little bit savvier and it seems like the mortgage companies are putting the brakes on the guidelines still. I mean, and we see some, some stuff coming down the pike. We're starting to see some companies doing second mortgages to uh, help people, you know, that don't have a down payments and others two mortgages on the property. We see some of those things that was kind of like the beginning, but it certainly seems um, like it's a much more rational market, if anything. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. The mortgage industry is a lot more cautious. You know, they they are offering the programs, but they're also offsetting it, you know, higher interest rates. They're making sure these people qualify a little better than they did back then. So and and the millennial buyers, they're they're more educated. I mean, you go back to 04, 05, the Internet wasn't as prevalent as it is now. I don't think I had a smartphone in 2004, maybe. Yeah, probably not. Um, and and you're right. There is a certain sophistication with consumers now that's different. You know, and part of what we're going to end up talking about, of course, is all the changes in the industry, all the um, whether it's an eye buyer or whatever, you, you know, all the other different changes that are happening in the industry. And part of that comes with technology. The good thing about technology is that it's given the consumer access to more information than ever before. So they know what the house looks like. They know what the neighborhood looks like. They've, they've done a virtual tour of the house. So those are all positives. And I, I, to your point, I think that makes a more sophisticated buyer, a more educated buyer. Absolutely. And, you know, when you get into the eye buyer, I'm, I'm very opinionated about that because I'm not fully sold on it yet. And I'll be honest. I mean, um, it's great to be able to look at properties. It's great to be able to find an agent. Um, however, at the end of the day, there's still a wholesale market and there's a retail market. And being in the middle remains to be seen what, what's going to be the outcome of that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm also very opinionated about it. I'm very opinionated about it because I believe when you become a real estate agent, um, 
we have, when you become a realtor specifically, we have a responsibility to the consumer. And I think if, if I'm going to be true to upholding that responsibility, we need to be outspoken about possible traps and landmines that consumers may run into. And I think I buyers at this time, I would generalize and say, for the most part, is some kind of a tr- it's a landmine that someone can come in front of, you know, um, because it's not fully transparent yet. You Correct. Know, I, that that's that's what I agree with the, is the transparency because yes, you have a a, a cash buyer coming along, for example, and let's say it's um, ten thousand dollars less than you're asking, but you're saying, hey, it's a cash buyer. Don't even need an agent involved. But then you get into the behind the scenes and was it more beneficial to look to your local realtor to get you top dollar for your home and at the end of the day probably make more out of your sale? Yeah, I mean, I have not yet seen and and I've had Maria Nunez on the podcast. I've had Matthew Wheatley on the podcast that are all getting offers on their listings. Um, I am myself doing the same thing. I've yet to see a case where an I buyer's not costing that seller at least five to seven thousand dollars, and that's at the very low end of things. Those are very few that are in there. Mm-hmm. But I would say the medium probably twelve, fourteen thousand, as high as twenty thousand. Matthew Wh- Matthew Whitley had a two hundred and some thousand dollar listing that the I buyer offer before they asked for repairs or anything, but the I buyer offer was a twenty thousand dollar gap versus what the home actually sold for. And so my question is always the same is how many people in central Florida, I mean, you guys are in St. Cloud primarily. That's where your office, your, mm. you know, your main office is. I know you have a few other offices, but um, how many of your buyers you think have $20,000 sitting on the bank? Not many. And the ones that do, how long did it take them to save it? Their lifetime is their biggest purchase in their life. So, you know, that's my whole point. Like, the fact that there's companies coming in town and trying to sell this idea of convenience, but not disclosing the cost of convenience up front is the part that I ha- that I find problematic. Because if what you're selling is convenience, just put a price to it. Tell people what it is. Say, hey, if you want to sell your house to us, we would make a convenient you know, transaction for you. And it will cost you 4% of the value of the home. Boom. End of story. Now now we're all clear on what the number is. Correct. But they play games. They buy the same. They buy two houses in the same neighborhood and they'll charge a different fee to each one of those consumers. Why is that? I, I don't know. To me, it's, it's the, um, I, I also do some investing too. And I look at it from both sides and I say, how do they sustain? Let, let's say a $200,000 home and they pay 190 cash. Well, they still have costs on their end, which they're making some of it up by hitting them with broker fees, hitting them up with repair fees, things like that. But they still have closing costs on the selling side. They have an agent on the seller side. So their margin is very small. And I, I'm going to say, and I could be totally wrong, I'm, but I'm going to say their margins aren't much more than $1,000 at the end of the day. And if this market that's strong does wobble a bit and they're into not millions, billions of dollars worth of homes in their inventory and they go up instead of up a thousand down 10,000 on that home there there's a big problem there and I could be totally wrong and I'm sure there's a lot of other opinions out there but you know for me I I think you know real estate is what it is our job is to go meet our sellers get the most money we can for them but also at the same time I think you're correct if you want to give them an option and lay it out there and say here it is just like the wholesale market then so be it. But I think that at this time there is a lot of gray area that's not being told and people are finding out after they're in contract. Well, and, and this is, this is my challenge. My challenge is if an I buyer would like to explain to me in an eloquent um, way that makes sense, because I'm not going to listen to some bullshit story, but mm-hmm. in, a, in a way that it makes sense, why is it that you can't have just a convenience fee for everybody? Why is it that people have to submit all of their information to you, all of their data to you before you tell them what this is going to cost them? Like it just irritates me as a consumer also, because I'm the guy that when I go to the dealership, I won't even test drive the car until we get something sorted out. Like what's this going to cost? And if we're going to trade in a car, what, what are you going to give me for that car? Like, 
don't do that thing where you tell me, let's go test drive the car and fall in love with it. And then we'll, don't worry about the numbers. We'll figure we'll that out later. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> no, don't. Let's not. I, I'm not that guy. Don't right. do that to me, you know. And so, so that's the thing about the iBuyers. I think they're a viable option. And I think it's an option that works well for a lot of people. And I've, si- I've set a few examples in the past. I think new construction buyers are some that could benefit from iBuyers. If they if they're risk adverse, if they just want to know that that home is sold and then live in it for some time, you know, like if that's the case, maybe an eye buyer is for you. But aside from that, I just don't think the average person, I don't think the average person has ten or twenty thousand dollars to pay for convenience. Like I think, I think that's an assumption that is that is it just shows how out of touch with with Main Street they are. I, I would say out of touch with Main Street because I think with us being in the in, in the uh, trenches, how many times do we really sit with a seller that says, "Yeah, I'm going to take twenty thousand less." They want twenty thousand more, and and our job is to get them in line with the right price for appraisals, which is really important in this market. But um, I think it goes right back to I think it'll hurt the wholesale industry more than it'll hurt us because the they're going to say, "Well, I can get ten thousand more from the eye buyer than I can the guy that's." putting signs out for to buy my home cash so like i said it remains to be seen we'll see where it goes i i think that the um the idea is great but um financially let's see where where it goes yeah i think financially for sellers i would be very concerned i think any seller that's looking into an i buyer should 100 percent of the time meet with a real estate agent that is well versed and educated on this and to just go over that I buy or offer and let them know just how much meat they're leaving on that bone. And if they're okay with that, then they go with the I buyer. But I think everyone should at the very least sit with a reputable agent before signing anything in that case. Um, and, and to your point of it remains to be seen. I mean, the department of justice just announced yesterday or the day before they opening this bro broad uh, probe on technology companies. They want to see, you know, whether it's a social media or retail, and they didn't name the company. So it's mm. uh, ostensibly, you know, the housing people are, are very much on the thick of this. They want to see what tactics tactics they're using to target people. You know, what, what information are you using to target people and whether what they're doing is a response to the what the market is asking for or whether they're imposing on the market because they control the flow of information, which is a big problem. It's a big, we always believe that technology makes things better always, and it's not the case. Technology can be used to suppress information as well. So, Well, I've always thought that is the king. <clears throat> and when they control or anyone control in any business controls the data, they control everything. And, and when they have the technology to do that, again, in any business... Um, that becomes a monopoly kind of, and, and that's what we need to, to watch out for. Yeah. And that's, I think that's why regulators are now looking at it. I mean, just again, with the, within the last 48 hours, regulators are saying, we're going to look into this. And I think there is a, a very genuine reason for it. You know, you have all these companies in Silicon Valley in a very small bubble, you know, creating the marketing and creating the rules and doing everything. And, and what ends up happening is the rules that they that are created oftentimes are difficult for them, but they're impossible for their competition. And so they still prevail. It's kind of like, you know, there's a good example of that with, um, I think it was Facebook and MySpace. At one point, Facebook um, started raising the concern about um, the use of social media for illicit activity. And I forget exactly what it was. I think it was something to do with, um, pedophile rings or something mm. al- along those lines. And so it totally crushed MySpace. It crushed it because they had no way to create the security or the verification that was required by the new regulations, which was burdensome for Facebook, but they could handle it. Mm-hmm. And it totally crushed their competition. So something that was difficult for them was impossible for their competition, which made them you know, just kind of own the one market. But to that end, we are left with customer service and awesome agents, which is what you guys do, right? Correct. I mean, you know, when when I started this, um, I thought about myself in 2002. 
I was a single dad. I signed up because I thought it was great to be with a company that offered 100%. And I went to a window, which company doesn't exist anymore. Um, went to a window, gave my debit card, gave my license, my driver's license, signed my paperwork. And that was it. I didn't know where to get a real estate sign, lockbox. I didn't know how to do a contract. Back then, if you remember, it was Realtor Planet. You had to go, and then you had to fill out everything by hand. It, it was it was way different, but I came from a point where I had to learn, and that meant I knocked on doors, I networked. I didn't know what else to do, and luckily, what I did worked because it, I didn't stop. I was relentless. I had to pay bills. Um, so when I started the Property Pros and I started bringing on agents, what my main goal was to help these people, you know, help these agents, A, know what they're doing. B, I know what it was like to be broke and say, wow, I just paid all this money. I don't even have $60 for a yard sign, let alone know where to get one. So we do things like, you know, we, we put signs in our agents don't have to pay for signs. They don't have to pay for lock boxes. Um, you know, again, back then the internet wasn't as prevalent. So, you know, now it's so much easier to have, we have a printer, we email everything over to the printer. He, he does magnets, whatever. Um, the other thing that's really important for, for me and my team is I want them to be out there and be educated realtors. It's not about the numbers for me. I mean, yes, we want to grow. And of course. I have a shell. We have three offices now and, you know, we have the room to growth and, and we've built it to be able to sustain the growth. But at the same time, we just don't want to hire anyone. We want people that want to be in this business. They have a passion for it. And at the end of the day, I love to spend the time teaching them how to do the contracts, how to do a comp. Um, we don't have too many problems in that area. I don't have to keep a lawyer on retainer because we've got so many issues going on. Um, it's also very important to have my team. Um, as you know, most people don't even know who I am. <laughs> right. You know, when yeah, we were talking about that before we started the podcast. Correct. You know, um, as the property pros grew, I, I needed someone to help gel the agents and bring them together and I had a, a lady that worked part time that um, was becoming a rock star agent, great attitude. And I said, listen, quit your job. Come work with me. I need you to gel it together. And she's been amazing. She's done exactly what I asked. She's she's the face and, and she's out there while I'm, I'm sitting there looking at paper clicks and how things work. And, you know, what are we building? Uh, she, she's my networker. And we have, you know, great branch managers in uh, Raul Otero and Viviana Casas that They've been with us for years, so they know what the culture is about, um, you know, what we want. And and um, <clears throat> you're familiar with Bobber Vance, I'm imagining. Yeah. I was lucky enough to sit in one time, and she said, you build a team, you build a culture, and if there's anything that breaks that or any cancer, no matter who it is, top agent, get rid of them. And um, I instill that in the team. You know, we work together on open houses. Every time we have a listing, you know, our team gets the shot at it from our agents. Uh, we door knock together. We, we do the basics. And to me, um, we, we definitely are not a lead based company. Um, I do work towards, um, how do you say it? Um, leads that are strictly to us. We, right. I can't, I can't even come up with the word right no, now. No, I understand. Yeah. But, um, you know, but that's, that's leads that we're building organically. I try to, you know, if agents want to buy leads, that's up to them. But I try to teach them to go out and, sponsor a little league team you know go out there and bring the parents hot chocolate when it's cold buy the kids cokes when they when they win and that's going to sustain you long term as an agent um you know if you if you base your model of business as an agent on leads if the market shifts a little bit and leads go down so does your business but if you're right. there and you're still and that's that seller is going hey you know you brought us hot chocolate uh you know why don't you tell us a little bit more because we're thinking about selling and and that's the type of agents we want to be uh, and in a world that, you know, the real estate world is getting so much, there's a giant competition amongst brokerages about um, agent count and technology and like the latest shiny object and, you know, who partners with who and all, all this nonsense. And I shouldn't say nonsense. That's a little unfair, but give mm -hmm. me a break. Um, what I mean is you guys are going back to basics and becoming masters of it. You, you know, you're learning how to dribble before you start t taking three pointers and you're doing that repeatedly time and time again. And you're doing it as a group, um, which I think it's very different from what a lot of companies are doing, because a lot of companies are getting away from the basics and saying, 
we can do it easier. Let's do it easier. Let's just let's just get you a bunch of leads because that's going to be easier, which is not, but it you know that's sort of the the mindset. I, I think a lot of people coming in the business, of course, you've been in it for a while and you know the hard work it takes. But a lot of people see successes and say, "I'm going to get my real estate license." I have no idea what kind of work it takes. It's a lifestyle. And um, I think a lot of companies are feeding off that by saying, hey, we make your life easy. We have all this technology. Um, you know, we're going to get you leads. But that that doesn't make a realtor to me. No, because this is the part that a lot of people forget. And um, this was wisdom that has been imparted with to me by a lot of people. But most recently, um, it was Jenny Weimer said this to me. And she said, we're still in a transaction-based business. And, and I don't think people keep that in mind enough. Like this is that you have to sell homes. I don't really give a shit how good you are recruiting, coaching, uh, you know, name it. Social, like all these other activities, I, you, you can be great at them. But if you're not selling homes, there is no lasting power to that. We're in a transaction-based business and you generate the most transactions cheapest by having a strong database and a strong referral base and you achieve that by doing the things that you're saying just becoming part of the community getting people to be loyal to you interacting with them all those things i think it's what what's going to build a long lasting business for people correct i mean we pay good money to be part of um, the association mls and most people complain oh it's so much money but we do have a lot of tools i mean you know, as far as our company paperless transaction, hey, that's provided by Transaction Desk. Um, you, there's there's things like in Cloud CMA to go out there and and post to get your uh, seller leads that most people doesn't even they don't even know that it exists. Um, but yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about the transactions. And if you don't teach your team how to make the transactions, you don't make money. It, to your point, isn't that on one of those things that it's incredible when it comes up? I don't know how many agents truly know how many tools they have in the MLS. It's one of those things. I've met with agents that have been in the business for years that are paying for a separate system to do their CMA on. By the way, not as comprehensive comprehensive as Toolkit CMA, for example, uh, as a Cloud CMA, but they'll pay for something else to to do an inferior product because they were not aware of it because no one taught them that tool was there or they'll pay for a system to be able to do the contracts because they were not aware transaction desk was theirs. That's baffling to me. Correct. I mean, I paid for years, $50 a month for a seller lead tool that I used to post on, on social media. And one day when my agents came in and said, Hey, but you get it for free here. And, and I'm running into that now with uh remind. I mean, great great program and and um most agents don't know how to use it and and if you go in there you can actually circle out areas get your expireds and pull up that property with the owner's name with the email with the phone number i mean how much easier does it get right so i i mean i had a new agent that joined yesterday and and when she joined um well not yesterday she started coming in the office and um i told her what remind was I had no idea and she's been in the business for quite some time and um, started dialing and said, heck, you know, I got all the leads I need right here. And made about 12 calls and, and got a FISBO appointment. There's someone, there's someone listening to this right now Googling it because they're not aware of it. And, you know, part of it, I think it's there's a bit of an infectious disease going on in our industry. And is um, there's too many brokerages not involved with the activities of the agents. And I know you are not one of those guys because you are in the trenches with the agents, helping them and working on contracts and working on lead generation and, and, and teaching and helping. But there's just too many brokers not doing that. There's too many brokers that delegate that to another person. And that other person's primary role is recruiting. And so when they're recruiters, they don't know any of this stuff. They're not understanding all, all the tools in the MLS. They're relying on other agents to kind of know this and pass it down the line. It's a really screwed up system, don't you think? Yeah. One thing that I'm not big on, and, and hey, it's keeping it real estate, right? right? So I'm not big on teams. I'm not a fan of teams. I think it takes away from the broker knowing what's going on and 
you get people that are bigger than their own brokerage. You know, they, you know, and, and DBR, DBPR is trying to crack down on it now, but you don't know who you're doing business with. You know, are you doing business with the brokerage? Or are you dealing with XYZ team? And they're recruiting people underneath them based on a almost like a multi-level marketing just to bring in numbers under them to make more money for themselves versus opening or, or having the education to be a broker. Um, I think that brokers should tighten that up a little bit, know what's going on with these teams because I've had companies, large companies that you talk to a team leader and say, I don't really care. Call so-and-so, you know, they have no respect for, for the company and what it took that broker to build what they built. Yeah. I, and it, like you said, there is a whole host of new regulations that were put out to try to help this, at least at least on the appearance, you know, with all the new advertising and marketing rules. But you're you're one hundred percent right. And I, to be honest with you, I've thought about this a lot, and I think the part that is that that's most sad about that situation. Is when you see a team that's doing, you know, a hundred transactions or more, you know, with four or five people in it, and they're giving up eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollars collectively to a brokerage when they could run their own brokerage for that amount of money for a lot less money than that, and they could be independent and they could, you know, be more um, transparent to the consumer in the way that they're doing business but they don't and that's sort of baffling to me because i've i've heard some arguments for it but none of them really kind of hold water when you start really analyzing it but but yeah you have big big teams that are on the default of a brokerage for some odd unexplainable reason what do you think what why, why do you think that is like why would a team want to do that well it's real simple liability you know, you can, as a team leader, and if you're doing 100 transactions, just throwing a number out there, you don't have to do anything but throw it against the wall, put the file in there, and it's up to the broker for that point to read contracts, make sure signatures are there, make sure, you know, title companies are, are on the contracts, all the little things. I mean, I was audited my first year by DBPR. I was the luck of the draw, but it taught me a lot. It taught me that, hey, every contract has to have that title information on there and all these things, but you know, your team leaders are great agents for the most part. And, and they're capitalizing that without having to take the liability, the cost, um, even to the point where I've seen brokers give up their business to go under another company, get rid of the liability and the cost and and capitalize on that. Yeah, there's certainly a bit of an incentive to do that for someone. There is. And I just don't, I don't think that's the way it was intended originally. I just think it might be a little outdated. It might be time to revise some of these things because just like brokerages with 500 agents, I don't think, I don't think the state of Florida ever intended to, for that to be the case when regulations were passed because there's no physical way a broker, a broker can oversee the activities of, of 500 real estate agents. I agree. And so then they say, well, they, they hire managers or they hire, you know, then those are not brokers, you know, then those are not brokers. Like if, if you're telling me that you are a broker that ha hires three or four office managers to do those things, now you're getting into really murky waters, right? Because now you're getting into, well, are those people licensed to do that thing that they're doing and provide that assistance? Well, some people would say they don't need to because they're just passing through information, filtering to the broker. But how do they know what to filter? It just gets really squirrely as far as I'm concerned. Well, the, the broker is basically releasing the chains and saying, you're speaking for me. Um, as far as like in my case, I try to make sure like my branch managers, they're also broke. They, they're broker associates. Right. They've went that extra step to become brokers. And and I've, I've sat with them and. I'd rather, you know, my thing to my team lead, my, my branch managers is why well, go start another brokerage? You have what you need here. You have the education, build your branch, you know, and, and you're going to still, I, they get to be under my thumb. And, and I think that's really important. I, I don't have the ambition to grow very large because I don't want to lose that at the end of the day. You lose, it's very easy to lose your culture when you have too many agents. Uh, it's very easy for people to go out there and get you in a lot of legal trouble. Um, and, and just, you know, again, the business, 
you know, next thing you know, you're losing 20 people because one person left with, with all, all that. Uh, yeah, and I don't, I don't think it's a lack of ambition. I think it's probably a lack of desire to lose all those other things. Correct. Some of my top agents that are, are broker associates say, I want to continue to do my real estate. I don't, I don't want to, they see what I deal with on a daily basis and say, I don't want to do that. And, you know, take it back, take it a step further is that great salespeople aren't always great paperwork people. And I'm pretty analytical by nature. So, you know, I sit and do accounting every day and, and things like that, where maybe that isn't their forte. You know, they, they might like to train, coach, uh, do different things like that. But, but to get in the nitty gritty of the business and doing the taxes at the end of the year, there's a lot more that goes into brokerages. And I've seen some people that just hardly in the business, just long enough to get their broker's license, think they want to open a business, have no clue what to do. Yeah, I and, you know, we come across that all the time when when you're doing transactions. We, if you do enough transactions, you, you'll come across those guys often enough. And, you know, you look up at their stats and it's like, oh, my God, they've sold $3 million worth of real estate over the last 10 years. But they're broker owners. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that that's not going to work. Because oftentimes this business... Every transaction is unique, but repetition certainly teaches you a lot. You know, doing something over and over again gets you better at doing it. And you see, you know, you see it on the paperwork. You see it on the way someone submits an offer. You see it on the way, the contracts and the paperwork that they use. I I mean, I would say once a month I get an offer on one of my listings that comes in a contract that's outdated because there's been newer revisions for that contract. But this one agent may have that contract saved to their desktop on a PDF. There's, they're, they're not going to continue you know, to the proper education at the board. They, they're not in a brokerage that teaches them when the new contracts come out. So they just keep sending that contract from 2015 to everybody. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, and I don't think a lot of people that get in the business understand just how important the intricate things are. Um, you're dealing with someone's livelihood. This is their biggest purchase of their life. And if you don't know how to comp a property that that's big it's huge we going back about two and a half years ago we started losing about five six deals a month and I said, what the hell's going on here and every one of them was an appraisal issue so we sat down as a team and i said okay i'm going to show you the way that i do it every offer you put in please come back to me double check it and same with your listings and that was like november two two and a half, two years ago somewhere in there and we we haven't lost deals based on appraisals because I tell my agents, if it's meant to be for your buyer, let them know, look, I comped this out and I'm supposed to be watching your back. And this house is saying it's 200,000, not 220. They have no comps to, to support it. So if it's meant to be, we're going to go in at 200 and, and go from there. And it, it solved a lot of problems for us. And, and um, even on the seller side, we do the same thing. We'll walk away from listings because what's the point of listing something 25,000 over? That's your seller that's going to harass you, beat you up, at the end of the day, fire you, and the next person's going to come along and, and, and list it for the 25,000 less, and you, you are the dummy. Yeah, that's, that goes back to expectations, right? And is as long as you have upfront expectations, this business becomes so much easier and so much less stressful. Like when I see agents that are all stressed about transactions, it happens that you you'll have a bad day where something happens that stresses you. But I certainly don't walk around stress most of the time, 90 percent of the time. And part of the reason is I became very focused on expectations. And like you said, you know, I'll go to a buyer and say, listen, you want to write that offer for that much? You want to go under? Con- Here's the thing. Nothing supports that value. So. We can throw it up against the wall, see if it sticks. When the appraisal doesn't come up value, you can play hardball. But just so you know, by that time, you're probably going to have at least lost your appraisal money. Right, possibly, your inspection. possibly your inspection mm-hmm. money. So, you know, is that something you want to do? And so people are like, oh, um, then they, they start thinking a little bit more. about. Listen, there's people that are that are willing to roll the dice a little bit more. They have more of that risky, adventurous personality, and they'll go like, yeah, let's go for it. Mm-hmm. And so then, you know, then we'll do something else. We may, may, we may extend, extend the inspection period past appraisal and do the appraisal first and then, you know, kind of try to get a little leverage on the seller. But, but expectations are what's key. When, when, when you have proper expectations, whether it's a buyer or a seller, it's a lot easier. And 
And to your point, listing for the sake of listing, I, I had that conversation with Jamie Miller. I was telling him he was surprised to hear that in sales meetings in big brokerages, people stand up and applaud every time somebody gets a new listing without consideration for the fact that some of these listings may be 50% overpriced and never sell. Like, why are you celebrating that this person just wasted $500 of their money that they'll never get back? It's, you know, take listings that are going to sell. Correct. I mean, what's the point otherwise? And, and the other thing is we try to go a step further. When we run into that, I tell the agents, call the other agent. Hey, Mario, how you doing today? You know, what do you have to support it? What is your seller going to do if it does come in 10000 under? Well, my seller is not budging, da, 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 da. Well, then you need to inform your buyer that there's a good chance they're going to lose $1,000, like you said. And that's our job. You know, I think that so many people are just so happy to have that client throw it against the wall, see what happens. And that's the person that's walked around stressed because now appraisal came. It's 10, 15,000 under. They don't know what they've to already do. spent the money. Spend money, <laughs> buyers' money's yeah. They, they they did what is that the e commission? You know that money spent already, and the buyers saying oh, you know I I can't find another ten thousand dollars somewhere, and the seller don't want to budge. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly it's it's the type of um, nuanced issue that that I think people in brokerages like everybody just needs to put down their guard, and someone needs to talk like if it was an AA meeting and say all right guys. Let me just explain to you why you don't want to do this. And so it kind of get through people. Because the other thing that happens, and I notice this at all a, a lot, is house is overpriced. And I call the listing agent and I say, listen, my buyer likes the house, but I can't really find any comp that supports. And so my new favorite phrase that works a lot is I tell people, let me level with you for a minute. And it kind of seems to bring them down a couple of notches. I'm like, listen, I can write this offer all day long, but you got to have a conversation with your seller that we're acting in good faith. And if the appraisal comes through, great. But if it doesn't, like, you got to prepare them for this up front. And so most often when I say it this way, I, I, I come away with a good conversation. But so often a listing agent would be like, what do you care about the comps? That's not your business where I got the comps. You like yeah. the house? Fucking send me an offer. Mm -hmm. Don't waste my time. Like, I can't tell you what we're going to do if it doesn't appraise. Well, I know you can't, but can we at least have a conversation? Can you prepare the seller for the fact that you have a buyer in good faith that likes the house and it's willing to pay whatever it appraises for? Can you tell that to the seller? Oh, have you ever come across one that says, yeah, we know, da, da, da. Oh, and we don't want an appraisal contingency either come across that oh get the heck out of here oh yeah that's amazing and it happens we we had it uh about two weeks ago and i told them fly kite you know i told the agent call them up and say no appraisal contingency i'm not gonna put the offer you're just way overpriced do a one dollar escrow oh yeah oh yeah i love that <laughs> too right so yeah you know and and um you know as far as as far as the market we're really blessed where you know, i went and took my son up to um alabama and we went up to uh, birmingham and I looked around and you see these brick homes that are probably built in the twenties, thirties, and you see a couple agents, but there's nothing going on. And you look at the market that we're blessed to live in and work in. And it's like, we've got tons of business here for a long time. Even, even when a market flops, we have tons of business here. That's why all the eye buyers are coming here. Absolutely. They're, they're hitting the bigger markets because do you really think, you know, Farmer Joe out in Oklahoma is going to really do an eye buyer? He's probably going to handshake his neighbor to sell the land. Well, and you'll find this interesting. I just, um, I, I got to start saving these articles so that I can put them with links under the podcast. But I just saw an article, I think it was on, it was in, I, I don't want to say the wrong blog, but it mm -hmm. was one of the real estate blogs. And this guy broke down the eye buyers are, Picking the markets that they go to, not by where there's most profit and not necessarily by size, but by where the values are most predictable to their algorithm. Meaning, um, I guess the number one market for flippers for profit in the United States is Philadelphia, which I thought was kind mm -hmm. of interesting. Um, but I buyers won't come anywhere near Philadelphia because the market's weird, right? You have houses that have a hundred year discrepancy in the time that they were built and they're all very different and there's not really 
a lot of HOAs, everything, it's kind of like their own thing. So the algorithms are terrible hmm. at trying to figure out the value of those homes. So they don't want to roll the dice there. They roll the dice in places like Las Vegas or Phoenix or Orlando um, or Dallas or Houston, places where there is a lot of these tracked home subdivisions that you have a lot of the same homes built at the same, um, roughly during the same time, same floor plan, same finishes, because their algorithms are more accurate in there. And so... That, that's very well said because even us, when we sit down and we know our local market and let's say you're looking over here down in uh, downtown Winter Garden, Ocoee area, boy, you can change by, by lot. You don't know what, and, and it's very similar to us in St. Cloud. You can have a house built in 1910 on the state streets next to a house that was built in 2005. And it's very hard. And if it throws off those algorithms, the, you know, they, they have a hard time. You're correct about that. Yeah, so th to me, that was an interesting thing to find out because it, it illuminated another part of this that I think it's important that agents know. They, they have some natural limitations to where they can and can go based on how predictable the values are, which means if you're really concerned about this or if the iBuyers are really destroying you in whatever, mar in, in whatever city you're in, just go a little bit east, go a little bit north, go a little bit south, go a little bit west, and you'll find a town or an area that that they are not that good at predicting the values on. And, and uh, you know, that's a pretty good recipe right there, I think. Oh, yeah, I agree with you on that for sure. Um, so what's next for the property pros? What, what are the plans going forward? You guys have done a lot of growth and expansion this year. Is that going to continue or are you going to put a lid on it for a little while? No, we're, we're putting a lid for a little while. You know, right now we're sitting with our, our Metro West location, which is in Veranda Park, uh, St. Cloud and over by Hunter's Creek at the Loop. Um, I tell people we have a shell and now we're going to build that shell and we're going to build it out. But um, one thing I'm very careful is I try to streamline a lot. I don't like to spend outside the box. Um, for me and the property pros, it's going to be a slow growth. We want to grow organically. organically. Um, you know, when, when we put a video out like we did today, it doesn't mean anyone that comes and says, hey, I want to be a property pro is going to be a property pro. Um, we're, we're a little bit picky on who we want. We want somebody that has that hustle, that wants to get out there and do it. And for now, we're just going to stay that status quo and, and slowly grow organically. Yeah, and, and there's you said something that that's huge, and um, and it's funny that you mentioned it today because in the last podcast, Amanda mentioned that also that you know if she hires someone that comes in and sort of upsets the apple cart in regards to culture, they're a goner because she has, she's hiring on personality. She is she's making a bet, which is the same bet that you're making that if you put like personalities or people that at the very least get along or have a, um, a, a common why on how they do their business and why they do their business, that it's going to create a stronger foundation to be able to grow on top of. And, and that's, a, that, that's very commendable because people in your position are oftentimes hiring people with a pulse and nothing else. Yeah. Well, I learned real quickly with the property pros because when we started, I was like anyone else. Oh, I offer 100%. There'll be 30 agents in the next two months working for us. Not the case. So, you know, it's funny you said the why. Um, I went to a conference with Lori uh, with Choice Home Warranty down in Tampa recently. Sure enough, I walk in. I had no idea it was a women's conference. I'm the only guy there. There's like two other guys there. And Wendy was speaking there. And I said, Wendy, uh, I don't know. This looks like a woman conference to me. But I sat there and I listened to a lot of stories and it was amazing that there was 300 women and they all had stories and why and the successful ones had the stories and what they've overcome and their passion of what they do. So we do something called Power Hour every other Tuesday. We don't do a typical sales training. We do like you said earlier, we, we put chairs in a big circle. It's kind of like our MO, you know, we put chairs in a big circle and we say, throw it out there. And we've got agents that are doing eight to $10 million with someone that's doing a million and, and just trying to make it in the business. But I think that's the best form of training than anything. And this Tuesday just passed, we did one on the why. And um, it, it sparked the whole brokerage because you had these people going, what is my why? You know, and, and me personally, I even gave my why. Mine was fear. I never want to go back to where when I lost everything, when the market crashed, you know, you lose your toys, your boats, your motorcycles, your new cars and things like that. So you know, fear was my reason for getting up and working harder and making my agents better every day. And we had some amazing stories go out 
throughout the room. And those are the type of people you want that have that heart, that have that passion. Not the person that walks in the door and says, hey, you get leads and what's your commission structure? I'm like, all right, how short can we make this? Right. You know? So Yeah, and and I think the the why is something that needs to be repeated often because one thing is the why is a fluid environment. It's not static, meaning your why today may be different in six months from now. I know mine changed and I didn't really truly realize that until, you know, I had my family and then I had my daughter and I'm like, oh, the why is definitely changing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's important that you continue to touch on that and that, that the agents continue to have to be being forced to reflect on it is important. There's a lot of things in life that if we're not forced to reflect on, we are just not going to do it. Like you rather just listen to the radio. You know, a lot of people have a very hard time um, doing that self-reflection. So that's that's one of the big values of doing the style meetings that you guys are doing with the power hour. I think that's that's powerful, no pun intended. Oh, it, it, it does. It, it builds team too. I mean, it, it isn't every, I, you know, I've, I've worked at companies before I was a broker and I never had the ability to sit down with the top agent and the top agent and go, this is what I do. And this is what worked for me, whether it works for you or not. And everybody's different. So when, when people join the property prison, you said it earlier, you can have all the technology in the world and things like that. But if you can't make the transactions, it doesn't make sense. So what we do is every agent that comes in, we do two hours of a business plan only. What is your goals? How many leads do you need to produce to do that? What are you going to do with your social media, your website, your circle of influence, all those things that come together. And we put it all and we ball it in. And I tell people, go out there and do it. I don't care if you can't do a contract. You come running in going, hey, I got a buyer. We're going to help you. But most importantly, let's get you doing some transactions. You can have all the technology in the world, but if you can't find a client, what good is it? Yeah, and that's the. it's a very good thing for sure. And, and the thing that I think becomes tricky sometimes is other brokers just that have tried the similar approach, they don't do it. Um, exclusively they do that while they're trying to grow numbers aggressively and then the net result is um, the agents that want to share want to share for their wrong reasons they want to share because they want to be superstars and they like the shiny lights and they you know they want to be on facebook live and you know and they that's a totally it's a different approach when someone is teaching because it comes from the heart versus someone teaching because they want to hear themselves. Because when someone just wants to hear themselves, then they'll tell you the story from rag to riches that they think is most appealing, not the one that's really going to help people, which is the true one. Absolutely. You're right about that. And, you know, the reason why our power hours, we even have people show is when people come to the company, what we tell them is, you're here today. When you're here, don't forget. And you need to give back to your team because that person's coming right beside you. And it's funny to see a brokerage of seven years. We've had our ups and downs and to see a culture go, you lose one or two, but you rebuild that culture. And if you keep that, that core that wants the same values, you'll overcome the one person that comes in. I mean, I I had a a $5 million producer, not, you know, this year, that started making waves and you know did it hurt me yeah because i like the person but you start creating waves you got to go and and it created a few waves when it happened but then we caught right back onto where we should be and and that's important in any business yeah because none of those the ebb and flow of culture or or of the morale in the office it never goes like straight up there you know it has the jagged edges right it has the little you know you go down a little bit but you hope you recover more than that and so listen as long as that's the goal going forward and and, and you keep that presently there's there's really not a way to fail on it i think you guys are doing a phenomenal job at it thank you i mean that's our business model there's so many different ones and and i can't knock any of them i mean everybody has their own idea their own business and how they want to grow. I mean, some people have the finances to go do things and, and buy tons of leads to give their agents. But um, my my heart tells me that I want that agent in five years to come back, whether they're with the company or not, and say, you taught me how to survive, and it didn't cost me no money. I went out there because I went and umpired baseball games because I loved it. You know, I um, one lady at the conference, she, she had had cancer. 
And she said, I went back to the uh, cancer hospital in, in Saint, I think it was St. Pete. And she goes with the dog to all the kids, you know, and she does out of her heart, but that's going to give her in her career longevity too. But she's doing something she loves. If you don't love what you do and love this business, you won't succeed because eventually if you're successful at it, it's a lifestyle. Well, that's the biggest thing. When you decide to take a project or an endeavor, do it because you love to. I mean, and Wendy on the cloud is the best example. And if anyone wants to hear the, the episode with Wendy, she was one of my first um, guests. Um, you can definitely look it up on, on, on our YouTube channel, Wendy Stewart. But she started doing Wendy in the cloud at, out of love for her community. And then it spun into something that generates business. But that was never the... That was never the intended consequence to begin with, and it's never the intended. Con it, it, it hasn't turned into the intended consequence either. She still does it just because she loves to do it. Absolutely, and you know that came from at one point she used to bring cupcakes to to businesses, and um, Wendy in the cloud is amazing because she doesn't push the real estate. It, being involved in the community, doing what you do, they're gonna find out what you do, and, and when they do, they're gonna use you. A lot of our agency, when, when we talk about social media and things like that, it isn't about putting the newest listing out there. It isn't about, you know, the home buyer programs. Don't let people start deleting you because they're annoyed by you. Right. Show them your life. Show them what you do. Show them the lifestyle, real estate. Stay prevalent in their face. And, and when they need you, they'll, they'll let you know. I, I think that's a, a great piece of advice to end this podcast on. Absolutely. Um, Anthony, um, if people want to know more about the Property Pros, how can they reach you? Absolutely. The, the, we have uh, the Property Pros uh, Real Estate on our Facebook, the business page. We also have the Property Pros Real Estate dot com. Of course, we're an open door. So, you know, I'm in the office every day. All right. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much, so much for having me.